but welcome and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Isle. I'm the Institutional Sales Manager for Pacific Premier Trust, the Division of Pacific Premier Bank, formerly Pensco Trust. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we provide custody solutions for alternative assets, uh, particularly with self-directed IRAs, private fund custody, we custody retirement plans, uh, we deal with successor custodian situations, ESOPs. So we're, we're fairly innovative and creative in terms of what we do. Um, our, our clients include a lot of family offices, RAs, broker dealers, investment uh, bankers, uh, asset sponsors, defined benefit plans. So we, we touch on a lot of the areas that this audience is involved in. Um, one of the things being part of a bank comes with the you know a compliance department, and the compliance department requires me to, you know, make a, to read off our um, mandatory disclosure. So, going to do this very quickly. Information is presented for educational purposes only. It's not as intended as advice. It may not be relied upon as tax, legal, investment, or other advice. Pacific Premier performs the duties of a custodian. And as such, we do not evaluate, recommend, or endorse any particular investment, whether it's a private company or whether it's a uh, uh, or, or whether it's a fund. So we don't we're not in the advice business. Is what you should invest in. Uh, Marty has a great audience for this, and over 400 people have signed up. Uh, and people come and go during these things. So at any given time, we can have a, a fair number of people online. And I know he's got a great audience there in New York. So we're very look, very much looking forward to speaking with everybody. So welcome this morning. Uh, this panel is on new media and gaming. So as such, it's supposed to be interactive. Uh, if, you, um, if you accumulate a million participation points, Marty's gonna give you a Winnebago. And for anybody under 40, that's not a cryptocurrency, all right? <laughs> So, uh, but the, so if you have, but the point is we want you to interact with us. If you have questions, type them in. If you're lucky enough, Marty will mute you and let you ask it directly. I <laughs> uh, would certainly encourage Marty to do that. Our panel consists of four individuals who are involved with running or advising media companies, uh, new media companies, or advising traditional companies on how to incorporate these elements into their business. And I think that is a fascinating conversation. Uh, as Marty said, the experts are the panelists, not me. I'm in the custodial business. They're in the business of the new media. And with that, you know, uh, I'm going to start with Mark Thimmick, the, the founder and chairman of Esports Entertainment. Mark, just take a minute, introduce yourself, give us your background, talk to us about Esports Entertainment Corporation. I think he's frozen. So, William, why don't you take the lead on this? And when Mark uh, gets unfrozen, he sees that yeah. Mike's type of difficulties. Here, <laughs> here, here I'm, I'm back with you, Mark. Oh, you're think, back. Can you hear me? You can yeah. hear you just fine. Yeah, we're Beautiful. just getting a little uh, bandwidth issues here once in a while. Uh, so, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you just fine. Keep going. All right. So, let me jump in and say, first of all, thank you, uh, Marty, and thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, it's great uh, honor to be on the program and join these other uh, experts in the industry. Um, Esports with a Z, E S P O R T Z network is the uh, primary way in which we reach uh, a global community of, uh, of news and entertainment people in the esports industry. We are also Reuters worldwide partner for esports news, and uh, we publish through the uh, Reuters Connect Network, which reaches over 3,000 news outlets and over a billion people a day um, on some of the most uh, significant events and activities, both in individual games as well as the industry itself, the leaders and so on. We also operate multiple podcasts, um, since I know that's important today. Uh, we are typically number one or in the top 10 of about 24 podcast delivery platforms with our Esports Minute and the Esports Network podcast. Um, and so we have a significant reach. We have, I think, somewhere in the area of uh, almost 800 episodes of those shows collectively that have been out there. We also have a college esports uh, podcast. 
that we recently started. And, um, and then we are in the area um, of production uh, for uh, eSports entertainment content, uh, most notably the Gamer Hour, uh, which we finished uh, wrapped up episode uh, or, or season one with 25 episodes with uh, uh, some of the most uh, well-known and respected entertainers and athletes across uh, many um, athletic areas, uh, NFL, NBA, MLB, as well as NASCAR, MMA, and so on, who are also active um, gamers uh, who enjoy uh, work, playing with the audience and, and uh, playing with individual people, uh, both um, their teammates as well as uh, just for a lot of events, charity, and so on. Uh, and so we're, um, we're also uh, starting to explore significantly the pay-per-view area. And when we get into the discussion, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think there's going to be a, a huge development in pay-per-view, given that many um, of the biggest artists uh, have not been able to be on the road uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, and there are other factors as well we can talk about if that's something you want to hear about but it's definitely gonna be part of the media landscape. So thank you for uh, allowing me to be on the program and I look forward to this discussion. Yeah, I look forward to it as well. Bill, will you uh, please do us the favor and now introduce yourself? Bill is uh, he, William Corbin, according to Marty Flyer, but I think you like to go by Bill. Either way. Uh, he's the head of revenue and partnerships from Sound That Brand. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Tell us about your background and, you, you know, can. You got, uh, thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, Marty, always a pleasure to be a part of anything you were doing. And thank you very much for having me. I'm William Corbin. Uh, you can call me Bill. Uh, I uh, My career has been spent in helping large companies uh, understand new digital media, um, assess which ones to go after. And then once we make the choice, actually engage their customers in those new medias. Um, uh, it, I got started out because when I was 20 years old, I was a page at CBS and I pitched them this crazy idea to build a website. Who knew that whole internet thing would take off? I'm still waiting for it. I didn't invent it, but I did build the first television website ever. Um, so, uh, and in doing that, it has led me to podcasting. And I love being here with Mark Thimming because He's in a hundred billion dollar industry. I'm in a billion dollar industry. So anytime a billion dollar industry gets to sit in the same conference with a hundred billion dollar industry, it is exciting. Um, and I'm now in podcasting. Uh, and I'm, I was hoping to tell Marty this last night, but uh, I can now first time publicly announce it. I'm now the CEO of a new podcast network called Quiet Please. Um, but I am deep into podcasting. I love podcasting. I'm really excited to answer any of your questions about podcasting or give you a little bit of the lay of the land. So thank you for having me, Mark and Marty, and uh, happy to be on the panel. Sure. Well, it's, it's great news. Congratulations. Yeah. Super well, fun. tell us a little bit about Quiet, please, now that you brought it up. Okay. So most people in podcasting, uh, quick, quick little lay of the land. Just so you know, Spotify, every time you listen to a song on Spotify, it costs Spotify money. Every time you listen to a podcast on Spotify, it costs them nothing. They just make money. That is why they are so desperately acquiring and trying to get into podcasting. It is a mega margin business for them. And the only, not the only way they can succeed, but one of the primary paths to success for podcasting or profitability for Spotify is through podcasting. Understanding that podcasting is growing really, really fast. Everyone's like, oh, there's a million and a half podcasts out there. That's nothing. When I started in the websites, there was a million websites. There's billions. There will be a billion podcasts. Quiet Police is not going after a hit. We are not going after the next big true crime podcast. We are simply going across the swath and looking at all the areas that are not currently being attacked by the podcast environment that will become emerge as growth areas for podcasting. We focus on podcasts that take advantage of SEO. We focus on podcasts that are evergreen. They just continue to churn and provide people daily information in nice snack size bites without the friction of having to go find it. Uh, we have about 20 podcasts that we've already launched and uh, they range in every category from helping you get to sleep helping you stay calm, helping you chill out, helping you get energy. 
uh, is really focused around podcasts that help people become a better person and have evergreen content capabilities. So that's quiet, please. <laughs> Thank you. I, I did quiet, please, just with my mute button there. <laughs> yeah, everybody should be quiet. Fantastic, Bill. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sure we're going to get a lot more discussion. You prefer Bill or William? I'll call you whichever Either one. Either I was one. Bill forever until I worked with five Bills, and then somebody called me William. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Had a similar conversation with Demetrio Kusakria, who is up next. And I'm, I'm sorry for the little hand gesture there, but I think it's appropriate. Uh, Demetrio is the marketing technology wizard at ZMark and QMark, uh, as well as on the board of several other companies. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Demetrio. So Demetrio, give us some insight into your background and all these companies that you're involved with. Sure. Uh, so I've, I've been at this like uh, Bill, uh, William, for quite a while uh, with sort of the nexus of how do you connect into technology and make it do what you need it to do to tell your story. So uh, the QMark brand that I work under that moniker is really about C-level strategy, executive advising, branding, and marketing for companies. ZMark is more about game production, creative tech, and team building uh, for companies that need, need those, those elements. Uh, we, it backed up by a history of introducing new tech, how to leverage new tech, finding ways to do so. A great example is when apps were new on the space, we went into AOL and helped them utilize application uh, mobile apps uh, to tell stories for Coca-Cola uh, and, and bring media in almost instantaneously. This is back in 2006. So it was kind of a, a monumental feat to do it that fast from around the world, bringing, bringing video about how to talk to their demographics uh, at that time. Lately, we've done things like, uh, you know, work with Uber to manage their, their uh, 35,000 uh, developers around the world in protecting PII. And we created transformer bots that Uber cars would convert into little characters that then help, you know, tell them to save and protect the PII. And when the driver gets out of the car, now it's the, the, the developer's responsibility to take care of that, that rider. Uh, at the same time, we're developing games. We work with Splash Animation as their gaming technologist uh, and help them devise the games around uh, at Saturday cartoons uh, for kids and, and things like that. We've got multiple titles that we're, we're working with right now. Uh, in addition, we've got a sci-fi project that we're in work in progress on, and we're developing an entire ecosystem with another company called Game Cloud Network uh, that is looking to find creative ways to insert sponsorship and branding without interfering with games into gaming experiences. Because as, as they were saying before, gaming dwarfs TV, film, and music in terms of revenues now. And a TV show becomes the anchor media piece for marketing for a game as opposed to the other way around. So we, we still think the old way, but the reality is everybody's after the game <laughs> and and the product and merch and things that can come as ancillary 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 elements of that so happy to be here marty thank you for having me on uh mark nice to meet you yesterday as well so happy to be here and contribute how i can great well i, I really appreciate that and this is going to be a fantastic session i think you get the sense of the dynamic group that we have here so Growing up, I, I was one of eight, seven siblings. Uh, and whenever we got in trouble, we didn't get in troubles by ourselves. It was always in pairs or, or, or threes. So one of my mother's favorite expressions was it was the blind leading the blind. Well, on today's panel, we had the blind leading the experts. Uh, to prepare for this, I, I watched last month's uh, session in Silicon Valley, uh, which was moderated by uh, Sue Chen. Uh, general partner at IOVC. What a great program. She's just full of energy and very upbeat. And Mark and, and, and William were, were part of that panel. And it was just a wonderful discussion. Um, and you know, I'm just hoping I can do it some justice today. Uh, but I want you guys to know you're going to have to work a little harder today. So uh, let's, let's dive into this. Let's get it moving. And let's get on with, you know, with the, the questions I have here. And Mark, I'm going to start with you, if, if you don't mind. Uh, you commented last month about the number of STEM skills that are learned from being a STEM, uh, uh, from being a gamer, and 
to a certain extent, I have a 20 year old son. He loves to play tanks uh, and he knows more now about World War II, uh, physics of tanks, the engineering of tanks, uh, a whole bunch of physics concepts and soft skills like being on a team, playing on a specific role within a team, leadership, strategy, communications, all from tanks. So I want you to talk a little bit about, you know, embellishing what I just said there and, and talk a little bit about the skills that huh? today people are acquiring. Huh? Oh, uh, uh, is Marwan on? But it's like a leave a message kind of thing. So I'm going to just do the mango mousse cake. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I don't know who this is, but if you could please mute, I'd appreciate it. Hey, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, I'll no jump problem. in there on you. Um, first of all, yeah, I think, um, you know, gaming uh, originally got a, a, you know, kind of a bad rap because there are a lot of violent games. There, there's no question about that. Grand Theft Auto is a pretty violent game. Uh, you know, some of these games are shooter games and so on. And, uh, and you know, generally because... Uh, parents oftentimes didn't really understand what was going on in these games. They all they saw was the violent aspects of it, or or uh, you know things that they they thought were you know not as appropriate. And there are certainly games that are not appropriate for young children. Absolutely the case. I certainly wouldn't recommend Grand Theft Auto to a you know a, a young teenager. I don't think that's appropriate. But they also don't recommend it. Um, so good for them. But beyond um, the, the activity, the shooting, or different types of uh, combat that goes on in many of these games, not all, but many of them, uh, there are those skill set development um, opportunities for a lot of young people, and not just young people, but older people. Um, and I was involved uh, many years ago uh, with um, uh, uh, an education program where we uh, created the first uh, high school athletic credit in the state of Florida for a, a game, which was a Tiger Woods Wii golf game, uh, because we had, uh, we did not have the facilities to provide a phys ed program uh, that allowed driving kids to the, the golf course and all that. We were able to produce that in a, in a nice room with a big screen. And the kids that uh, took that course, to your point, knew more about the game, the strokes, the rules, uh, the type of, of shots to make, the type of clubs to use at different uh, times and so on, than kids who were oftentimes taken to the course and say, let's go hit some balls. And what was nice about it is when these young people were taken to the course, um, they were already ready to, uh, to participate in golf in a much deeper way than kids who really didn't understand the game, the rules, and uh, how to use the club. So that's just one simple example, but you're right on. This is a huge learning opportunity. And there's a number of companies now that are exploring ways in which to uh, take what is being done in games and, uh, and create career paths for a lot of young people who are excited about gaming and want to make a career out of it. So that's a whole new educational uh angle, so to speak, it goes beyond, you know, graphics design and, and uh, programming and coding and that type of thing. This is, there are many other types of careers in the field of esports and gaming that are now emerging and career paths and educational programs to accelerate those career paths. So um, I welcome, you know, the thoughts of other panelists as well, Mark, they, they probably have their own experience with their, their own kids or or even they may be gamers i don't know <laughs> yeah, yeah I, mean, I demetrio i you know and i bill I, I you popped up here i don't know if you were going to jump in you can certainly do that if you'd like go right ahead well i was just going to say you know adding on what mark was saying i'm actually on the board of trustees of a boarding school and i was at a board meeting probably two years ago and they were assessing the threats to education and we did a whiteboard and we were writing them all down and ranking them and gaming and esports at that time they considered a threat. Uh, fortunately, somebody on the board stood up and said, "What you've identified as a threat is probably one of our biggest opportunities." We enacted a scholarship around gaming, uh, went hardcore into gaming. It was interesting uh, on the panel that was with Mark and Sue uh, a few months ago. She brings in that whole gamification. And really what you're seeing esports and gaming doing is it's going to 
cause a major shift in how education is act, how kids are taught. Uh, this gamification, we're now starting to understand that it actually is help, you know, the brain works in a certain way that if you allow gamification, it's actually learning faster and better. Um, so what we're learning from all these kids, they're loving games. Well, let's use that love of games and, you, you know, use that to teach people. <laughs> so I think what Mark is saying is dead on that uh, this, you know, from fear, we're now starting to embrace it. And once we start to embrace it, we're really going to start to understand the power of gaming and esports beyond just the consoles and being on there for entertainment. So that's it. I was just going to add to that. One of my friends and advisors is a fellow named Chris Mate, who was part of the creative team uh, that launched Grand Theft Auto back in the day, ages and ages and ages ago. I just want you to know he did his penance and then f went on to f help found Animal Jam with Nat Geo. <laughs> <laughs> Animal Jam is one of the biggest subscription kids games there is. Did a stellar job at uh, at uh, to, you know how to you know navigating how to set up the filters in the right way as a parent myself i've got thir two twin 13 year old boys and i just can't get the filters right on spotify to keep the the wrong rap from blaring in the house uh, uh but uh you know I, I i i just think it's a it's just technology is a thing it's it's like we were talking about yesterday mark it's a it's clay and it's there for us to do with what we will and and we can make good decisions about it. We can make poor decisions about it. And at the end, at the end of the day, the creatives and the, you're only as good as the content you have. Uh, one of the side projects I've been doing for literally 20 years has been working with the Museum of Tolerance, tracking the promotion of hate and intolerance through uh, alternative media, social media, and putting out a, a digital terrorism and hate report that gets presented to the UN and different governments and law enforcement officials around the world. And it's just, uh, it's really eye-opening uh, what's out there and what the bad guys will do to get their word out. Uh, it, it's amazing the effort people will go to to, to put their agenda out there. Uh, and uh, what you know, I just to be creative with the good stuff, right? And Yeah, well, I wanted to actually take this a little bit different direction, especially with you, Demetrio, because it fits in your, your business here. And you know, we're, we're talking about it, education a little bit in the school situations, things like that. But it, there's also a fair amount of, um, you know, employee education going on, corporate development, mm -hmm. things of that nature, using gamification. And there's also uh, consumer training. I mean, when I got my last phone, there was this little avatar that popped up and walked me around all the features of the phone, right? Annoying as heck, but nonetheless helpful in figuring out how to use my phone. So I've talk to me a little bit about how these things are being incorporated in, yeah. in, in employee probably. training and, and consumer training too. Well, I was, I, I was I'm probably dating myself, but I, I don't know if you remember Clippy from Microsoft, the little clip that- Oh yeah. That's, yeah. A, great, that's a great early example of you know, making it fun to learn something. We all were faced with how do you handle word processing? And they just had this little character that just made it a little more fun to engage with this thing. And at the end of the day, how do we tell our story, right? And do we find creative ways to leverage tech and do unique inventive things? Uh, and it's really about storytelling, positioning your brand, uh, communicating with your audience in a creative way. We have one client that was uh, a woman owned business that, uh, they, they sell cabling for data centers. Well, so we reinvented them because it was a woman owned business as, you know, flexible gymnastics, uh, gymnasts, you know, so they could, they, we could tell their story through, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, back bends and flipping cables instead of just, instead of just, you know, hardware, right? Uh, we had another client that does 3D metal printing and they had a, a static brochure site that, that uh, uh, just really kind of dull when they're at the cutting edge with proprietary technology, eating their own dog food, setting up mass production of, of metal 3D printing. They make everything from airplane parts to uh, li little surgical instruments that they can print in, in minutes. It's insane what they can do. And so we reinvented how they told their story with uh, you know, and, you know, high-end animation, uh, with bots that are, you know, like the little Pixar lamp and, and uh, moving through the process and talking about how their manufacturing process is actually a software 
process now. It's it's changed how they do what they do is now digitally done, uh, and and so there's all, all it's the, the Uber example I gave before. You know how how do you get that story across and gamifying what you do? Uh, I, I my wife works in the veteran space as another example, and we've been strategizing how do you get more. Uh, uh, exiting service members to leverage their GI Bill benefits, and the problem is is one of engagement. It's like how do you how do you reach them? How do you excite them about the educational opportunities they have after they get out of service? And it's really hard to convince number one people who quite often have uh, I'll call it imposter syndrome about what they do uh, to engage the fact that they've learned discipline over the last six, eight, ten years and could, new, could now be academically inclined when they weren't before. And they, they're new people, they've reinvented themselves. And if we gamify that experience or help them self-select and self-direct about what they wanna do through AI, deep learning, move them in a pathway that's much better for them. So something that's really exciting to me is how, how we leverage tech to, to activate people especially when we've seen what we've seen the last year and a half. I mean, this has just been, yeah. I, you know, I, I never stopped working. I'm trying, you know, I feel for the people who had to stop working, but it has been so busy the last year and a half. <laughs> I want to actually go back to, to Bill here for a minute. And I, one of the things I say is there's a comment. And after this, I would ask, I know Mark has already put his contact information into the chat. Demetrio and William, if you would do the same, I'd, I'd really be appreciative of you doing that. But William, I want to come back to you for, for a minute here. And last month when you were on the, the panel, you, you rattled off some pretty impressive numbers about how much time people are spending on new media. Uh, and I wanted you to talk about that and, and why you think that is. And, you know, are you, is this going to continue or are we going to reach a, a point where we plateau off? Uh, you know, what's, why don't you give us your insights there? Well, first off, Demetrio, way to bring back Clippy. That is going to terrorize me for the rest of the day. I almost want to give you the blue screen of death because I think you, my therapist is going to need to talk me out of this. Um, so, Clippy, Clippy. Clippy, man. The symbol of Microsoft's demise. No. Um, but uh, so, you know, when I look at the new media landscape, be it gaming, podcasts, internet, et cetera, you know, I always hearken it back to when I was a child and my brother, sister, and I, we had one phone in the house and we used to fight over the time that we got to use that phone. Well, all these things are just fighting over the time that they get to consume your eyeballs and your ears. It is share of time. What is astounding is as all these new things come out, they seem to be increasing the share of time. Uh, when people were watching tons of TV, they would say, oh, it's an average of a half hour, hour a day. Facebook gets an average of 54 minutes a day. Um, gaming gets an average, you know, people who play games will play on average of two to three hours a day. So as these new things in podcasting, you know, the average podcast they listen to is 22 minutes, but they're listening to 90% of it. If you can get people to focus for 90%, uh, you know, for 20 some odd minutes of your message, that is powerful. Uh, but as these things come out, they're just getting better. They're consuming more of our time because we're more, we're finding ourselves, they're more friendly to use, they're easier to use, uh, they become less friction to actually use them. And so as they start to consume more of our times, I think it's really important to focus on which ones are taking up the most of the time. Why? You know, <laughs> Kids aren't playing games just because they're having fun. There's something going on in their brain chemistry that is, you know, when they say it is addictive, it is, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, podcasting, it it's the theater of the mind. What's going on in the brain is it's actually because ca you because you have to create that image of what you're hearing. It's causing these chemical reactions in the brain that are actually releasing these dopamines that are making that pleasing to you. You could be listening to something that you don't like, but it is just, it's to your brain and to your body, it's pleasing, it's nice, it's relaxing. Um, and so as technology continues to improve, especially when AI, I'm, I'm on the board of a, a empathetic computing company that has developed AI. This AI takes in video, audio, and text, and it can tell your mood, what type of person you are in a nanosecond. 
it can then throw you the type of content that it knows you're going to like. So very quickly, based on your facial incantations of how you answer questions, it can determine, okay, this person learns through gamification, this person learns through storytelling, this person learns through reading. And it will start to pre present you the content in which it automatically knows. And when I tell you this AI is sophisticated, it can already pre-diagnose 34 conditions, uh, bipolar, diabetes, all these things, just from looking at your face and hearing your voice. Uh, and that's, that's today. In a year, this thing's going to literally be able to send the car to your door that you know it knows you're going to like, and you will not be able to compel yourselves not to give the credit card to buy that car because the AI knows you that well, that fast. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a reason we're spending more time with it because it, a lot of these new medias are really interacting with our brain chemistry. That's well, I'll, I'll add, I'll add to it, Bill, that, that, uh, it's also multiple forms of consumption simultaneously. Yeah. Kids will play games and also run a discord, uh, channel server so that they can co have a conversation at the same time. And, and it, it, so it's not just the one it's multiple. And they're getting very good at multitasking those different elements at the same time. And their brains, the brain isn't really meant to, meant to process that much information. Yeah. So when you speak to your child and your child looks at you and blinks their eyes a little bit, they're having, they're having to slow down, you know, and literally we're in a battle now where it's actually, I mean, I, I literally, this is ground control for me. I, with my children, I have to like, tamp it down, say, okay, guys, this is enough. You know, your brain needs to turn off for a while, get outside, you know? And they're using, you know, uh, with the big data is really helping inform their decisions as they build these, you know, Madden NFL, no big secret. When uh, that great pass that gets everybody so excited, what they did is they took the, call it 10,000 greatest passes of all time, based on the AI hearing the cheer of the crowd when the pass was thrown and caught. They machinate that down basic, you know, from the best to the best to the best to the best to the best. And that creates one pass on Madden NFL. Um, and they're doing that for every single element of the game. And so, you know, I'm not a big football player, but I'll never forget that Ahmad Rashad catch in the end zone of, you know, the Vikings versus the Saints. And, if I can still remember that, imagine if they take a thousand of the greatest of those of all time, and that's just one pass in Madden NFL. These, of it's course, even, these kids. Getting, are it's even going. getting weirder too because you have yeah. like a, there's a company called Bitfry that actually my friend Chris made, who was the guy who was Grand Theft Auto, and he he's now with mm -hmm. this company Bitfry. They've got a deal putting stuff into Apple Arcade, and uh, uh, what they're actually doing is they took Wayne Gretzky, put him in a hockey game, then they go and they take a football star and stick him on the ice with Wayne. <laughs> yeah. so you've got these incredible mashups of just really fun entertainment where the skills of that individual athlete, regardless of the sport, are then put in a basketball game or put in something else. And they're working with all the players associations and all of the, all of the things just to make really fun experiences for people. Yeah. Sounds great. I want to bring in Mark into this conversation. And we got a question from the audience and I'm going to ask Mark to address this. Uh, and the question's from uh, Jonathan Cohen. It's as a non-gamer who, who is a parent of a grade school kid, I would pay for a service that sets my kids up to play age-appropriate games and getting, getting an internet safe way. Getting her to set up to play Minecraft, for example, required a lot of time and frustration. And I had to teach myself how to play, uh, how to play, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, at first, Microsoft's web interface is hard to navigate and Google searches yield a lot of garbage. Um, yes, I'm, I'm familiar with that frustration. I will tell you though, they, you know, what are you know, and maybe Mark can comment on this too, but uh, one of the interesting things, I think, I don't know if it was this, uh, if it was uh, Minecraft or if it was Roblox, if, if you could please move, thank you. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, 
I don't know, it was Minecraft or Roblox, but one of the interesting things was when pandemic first hit, I think it was Minecraft because it was Microsoft. They, they actually created a concert with four different stages and 27 different acts that you could go attend and stand there. So this is really becoming pervasive in, in our social and how we socialize with people. So you can meet up with friends there and go jump around and watch the different bands and, and have a shared common experience from different points of the earth. So Mark, take it away. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And there, there's going to continue to be a uh, uh, technological innovation. Before commenting on that, I just want to mention one quick statistic, you know, Twitch, which is just one of the communication channels for gaming and conversation communication, uh, to had a total of 6.34 billion hours watched in the first quarter of 2021. So and that's, that's an increase over last year. So is it stopping? No. And that's just Twitch. That's not YouTube and a whole lot of other Facebook, et cetera. So uh, that's a lot of hours. Um, so we are spending more time online. I think it's great that um, uh, parents are learning more about their kids and, and gaming so they can understand and communicate with them in the language that they understand. Um, there are there is a company called Smurf S M E R F that is is actually working and has a program uh, that addresses his issues where you're matched up with other children of similar age and similar ability in order to gain because there are a lot of parents that are very uh, concerned about their 13 year old getting online and playing with a 30 year old. Um, that's really not appropriate for, for a lot of young kids. So there are a, a couple of companies. Smurf is one I know um, that has uh, really got a great program, a, a variety of different uh, games. They can also um, work with an individual school or a club to lock it down to only the members of that classroom or school or that club um, and not allow others in and so on. So these are things that uh, are definitely being worked on. Uh, because there are a lot of parents who want to make sure their kids are, you know, they're not exposed to things that are inappropriate for, for their age group and, and how they feel about it. You know, the other thing I think is that, you know, with respect to the explosion uh, of gaming and, and the value of gaming in terms of learning for all of us, um, you know, the, the whole um, esports media uh, world is, is starting to get the attention of tier one and tier two uh, sponsors and advertisers. Um, there has not yet been what I would consider a big rush in by tier one, tier two sponsors, but more and more they're getting involved, whether it's Ford Motor Company or BMW or snack food companies, Coca-Cola, et cetera. Um, they're starting to recognize that if you wanna reach that younger audience, um, you've got to have programming that is authentic and wherever possible, integrated, integrated in the conversation, integrated in the programming, or integrated in the game. Uh, and we're and because of technology, we have um, providers that can, in fact, you know, literally put a Coca-Cola billboard up when you're running down the street as you're going through a shooter game. Uh, they can integrate all kinds of things. Uh, we've done it in our in the gamer hour. We uh, we worked with. Um, uh, uh, Turtle Beach, uh, who makes some of the best headsets out there, and we integrated all kinds of events and activities and gameplay with our athletes wearing their Turtle Beach headsets and doing things of that nature. So we're going to continue to see um, an advantage with this type of media that gives uh, um, the uh, sponsors and advertisers far more engagement and integration than traditional media. So I just wanted to throw that out there and maybe some others would like to talk about that. Yeah, I've, I've definitely, so four years ago, I actually worked with Coca-Cola on their sponsorship of League of Legends. For those of you guys who don't know League of Legends, know it. Uh, it's Riot Games, only game. Uh, to give you an idea of how powerful it is, Beyonce did a live concert that was streamed online. It was considered huge. It got 100,000 concurrent. League of Legends world champion uh, two years ago had 21 million concurrent viewers on their live stream. 
So if Beyonce gets 100,000 and something else gets 21 million, focus on the 21 million. Uh, League of Legends is probably one of the most popular multiplayer games of all time. Um, but it was hard. Coke really wanted, they did not understand that sponsorship. Sorry, Coke is on this line. Uh, and Riot Games did not understand at the time how Coke wants to be a sponsor. So it was a, you know, League of Legends brought the people, uh, but Coke didn't understand how to engage those people at the time. And I would say League of Legends really didn't know how to work with the sponsor to make them authentic. Because ultimately it is on the gamer side, they know what authenticity is. And what Mark was saying is so important for any brands that want to get into this space. If you come into gaming and you're not authentic, you're done. There's no second chance. The gamers will hate you. Right. Uh, BMW, one of my uh, five years, I was ran all their digital activations. Great client. Um, I was always cautious for them getting into the space because it is, it is very difficult to uh, be authentic, <laughs> and uh, you just have to be. So, uh, great insight, Mark. Authenticity is so huge in gaming podcasting and not, and not and not destroying the gamers experience too that's yeah. really they really at the end of the day it's really about that they're there to play the game so if you interfere yeah. with what they're doing you've lost them and yep. they will they will reject the experience and walk away uh the difference being uh for example i'm uh, working with game cloud network right now and they've got the 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 new version of subway surfer which if you're not familiar with it is the most downloaded mobile app of all game of all time uh, this, uh, uh, the, the difference being you can take your avatar, put a, put a, a hairstyle on it or a pair of shoes. Well, if those shoes have Nike branding after the game is over, did you know you ran in Nike, Nike, uh, yeah, subway surfer, uh, uh did, did you know you, you ran, you know, a hundred miles in Nike shoes? Would you like that shoe? <laughs> That's a different question, you know, uh, uh, than, than putting something up that you force somebody to an interstitial that you force people to get through to to be able to play and activate their experience so it reminds yeah. me of the old seinfeld you know where they try to get the product into the in the, on the seinfeld program so people would pick it up and use it uh, and i i know we could go on about this forever and ever but a lot of people are interested in the business model surrounding this this business uh and and you know where are the revenues currently uh, most online businesses you know, function on a five to 95 model uh, for about, you know, 5% pay is the large part of the business. Uh, I remember back in the day it was premiums and, you know, clicks and, and that sort of thing. So we've obviously seen the evolution here in the business model. Where is it today? I gave a bit of a thing, but where's it going? What's the business model going to be? It sounds like new revenue streams are being developed through sponsorships, uh, maybe live events and gaming there. They've kind of started as well. So why don't you talk to me about that? And, and you know, particularly and how does, in, please, Mark. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, I was just no, going to say, particularly how a family in. office would want to engage and be interested. Yeah, I'll tell you what's, got, what's really going on in the, in the industry um, in a huge way uh, is, uh, is consolidation. Uh, a lot of uh, merging roll-ups. Uh, if you look at some of the bigger uh, players, uh, they're following a philosophy, you know, that, that we used at AutoNation when I was with AutoNation, one of the early guys there. You're, you're buying some of the best properties and you're building with a combination of acquisitions and organic growth. And what you're delivering to sponsors, advertisers, and others in the industry is more reach, more engagement, more types of engagement when you roll up different types of esports and gaming companies that do have commonality, but at the same time, each offer different types of things. So you're going to see a continual roll up of the best companies in the business uh, because you have to, you have to get bigger. You know, we're in, involved in that process right now. And, um, and then the other uh, execution piece is you not only have to get bigger, you got to get public because the public capital is really what's necessary um, to drive these companies over a period of time until they can reach effective uh, profitability. Uh, most of the public companies you'll see that are in this space, 
that are not the publishers, I'm not talking about Riot and so on, but the esports and gaming companies, they're not, uh, they're not profitable companies in many cases. Um, so they've, they've got to beef up um, with more resources, more companies and so on. So that's what you're going to see in this industry more and more. And you're going to read about that more frequently. Fantastic. William, I, I want to go over to you because you made the statement up front that, you know, you know that Mark operates in a hundred billion in dollar industry and you operate in a billion dollar industry. So obviously the models are a little different. And, and I guess my question to you first and foremost is, you know, are, are podcasts new soap operas of the day? Uh, yes and no. So they're the new soap opera. They're also the new a lot more. They're the new news, the new weather, the new horoscope. They are your newspaper, plus they're your television and the movie screen a little bit just in your ear. And they are a solo experience. If I was a family office looking at the podcast landscape, I'd look at just like I looked at the television landscape a long time ago. You have the broadcasters. Those are the Apple, Spotify, Pandoras. And they have great broadcasts, but without content, they have nothing. Then you look at the content providers. So I'd really be focused on which content providers have shows that are sustainable and don't cost a lot to make in which platforms have the most people and the longest consumption time on those platforms. Uh, I mean, right now, a good play is Apple and Amazon. <laughs> They're going to be in the podcasting space. They're not going anywhere. Um, safe bets. The earlier stages, it's really looking at these content companies who have a significant amount of downloads and subscribers, like 20 million plus that Spotify would look to buy for $200 million uh, because there is a fever of acquisitions going on and consolidation among content providers and platforms. A new one, I also love any platform that is creator focused, but has that reach. A new one just went public on NASDAQ yesterday, the day before ACAST, I love them. Oh, fantastic. Mark, I, you know, last month you you spoke a little bit about the industry and and, and William just mentioned that it's consolidating and, and Spotify's buying up different properties. Uh, but you, your your company has made a number of acquisitions. Uh, so, Mark, could you tell us just a little bit what you look for in an acquisition candidate, what you're trying to achieve strategically with your business and how this all works together? And then finally, you know, let's get down into the, you know, the grinds and then talk about the numbers a little bit. What, you know, how do you value those those businesses and, you know, what's their worth to you? No, it's a great question. Um, you know, what, what we look for um, is we look for uh, content providers uh, that are producing content and we look at organizations that are already working with um, strategic sponsors, tier one, tier two sponsors. You know, a huge part of, of really being successful in the business is not only having content to distribute, whether it's games, matches, um, uh, programming, uh, we're just about to shoot the, uh, a new uh, TV show that'll that'll be uh, the uh, mansion. It's uh, it's going to be a mansion in northern Cal or in um, Virginia, uh, with about ten gamers and streamers. It's reality TV. It's a lot of great stuff. We'll be live streaming as well on Twitch. So we look at organizations that can uh, build and run and develop programming of different types in an affordable model. We, we're staying away from organizations that have uh, sunk huge money into uh, what I would call fixed overhead. Um, that that is, a, is really not the right way to go. There's plenty of a virtual studio space out there. There's plenty of actual space. So there's no reason uh, for any of these game companies to overload on, uh, on heavy assets. So we, we stay away from uh, heavy overhead and, and that type of thing in these companies. Um, in addition, you know, what we're looking for is, is a steady stream of revenue that's also, um, that's growing, that, that uh, uh, they're attracting more people um, and they're growing it across multiple streams, whether it's social media or whether it's Twitch or YouTube or whoever their distribution uh, platforms are. For example, in our Gamer Hour, we distributed through 53 platforms and we're in the final stages of approval for Amazon Prime for our 25 episodes of, uh, of the first uh, season. So we're looking for other people that can uh, complement that. 
We're also interested a little bit more now in the uh, physical game space companies that know how to run a physical game space. Because with COVID getting behind us, I think there will be uh, more interest in that. And then finally, um, we're very interested in, and we're in discussions right now in a JV with a pay-per-view partner, because we really believe that with I think we, we lost them there, road, which is unfortunate. Pay per view. Oh, here he is. Uh, we, also, uh, here, uh, we, we think pay per view has got a great future, and there are lots of reasons. And I'm always happy to talk about that uh, maybe in a future panel, too, Mark. So thank you for the opportunity. No problem at all.